19. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, as much as you can, I want to ask you to imagine this scene. If it's helpful, you might want to close your eyes to do this. So it's just outside the walls of a bustling city. A rocky hill, an execution ground. Golgotha, the place of the skull. A man covered in blood is carrying a wooden cross. And even now he's unrecognisable. His body is beaten and bloodied from being flogged repeatedly. The bone and glass in the whip that was used to flog him has torn the flesh from his body, exposing his muscle and his bone. The man stumbles under the weight of the cross. Flanking this man on either side are Roman soldiers, dressed in armour from their heads down to their feet. Let's pause for a moment. Who are you backing here? In this situation, in this scene, if you were a betting person, who would your money be on? Would it be on the might of the Roman soldiers? Or would it be on this broken man? So the man is led to the place of execution. His clothes are taken from him and the soldiers divide them amongst themselves. The man is laid against the horizontal of the cross and six inch metal spikes are driven through his wrists. And now he's hoisted up against the cross. More metal spikes, this time through his ankles. And hanging in the air, with nothing but the nails to support his weight, he pushes his body up and down to breathe, struggling for life. And to add to the physical pain of the cross, there's the shame. Let's be completely frank and honest here. This man was naked. There's no, there's no cloth around his waist covering his body. He's naked and exposed. And above his head is this mocking note that reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It's even written in different languages so that as many people as possible will get this joke. And all around, people look on. And one of them is this man's mother, I wonder what is going through her mind in this moment. 
Did she have any idea that a day like this would come? Could anything prepare her for this moment, the reality and the horror of the cross? And the man speaks to his mother and to a friend. And something about being thirsty. And then later, at last, the suffering is over. And his head drops. And to everyone watching on, it looks like death has won. Have human beings ever invented a more disgusting and barbaric way to kill a person than through crucifixion? It was so drawn out, it was so barbaric, and it was so public. And you know, that was the point. It was to shout to everyone watching that the Romans were in charge, that they ruled the show. Why was it near the city walls? It was there so that as many people as possible could see the horror and learn to fear Roman power. And the Romans themselves knew how barbaric it was. See, Roman citizens were rarely ever crucified. And if women were crucified, they were crucified with their faces to the cross so that people wouldn't see the suffering. This was a power game. The physical agony, the shame and the humiliation of the cross. This was a public spectacle. And yet, and yet, John, the gospel writer, Jesus' friend, as he writes that account, as he looks back on this event, knowing all the events that followed, understood what was really going on in this moment. See, John could see the truth through the horror. Can you? Can you? I grew up thinking that um, Good Friday was the sad bit before the happiness of Easter Sunday. I used to think we were meant to be mournful on Friday and then joyful on Sunday, but I think I'd misunderstood the cross. I believe it is a time for reflection, but to mourn? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because as you read John's account, you get the sense that somehow Jesus is overseeing the whole process. Let's look at it again. I love that opening line in that passage. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. It made me laugh when I read that line. Because did they really take charge of Jesus? Do you see the irony here in that? That this is Jesus, the eternal God, the one who's always existed. He is the word become flesh. The one who created everything from nothing. And these human soldiers took charge of him? Does anyone really take charge of Jesus? And that notice above Jesus' head, that somehow all of Jesus' powerful opponents are completely powerless to alter. And Pilate says, what I've written, I've written. See, the glorious irony of the cross is that the one who is mocked as king of the Jews is king over all. King over those soldiers who are nailing him to the cross. King over the chief priests. King over Pilate. King over the universe. King over your life and mine. I mean, it's a completely different kind of king to any we've ever seen before, but he's king. And then as Jesus' clothes are divided between the soldiers... John looks back and sees that it's fulfilling scriptures. See, David, writing prophetically a thousand years earlier, had written, They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And those words that Jesus utters, I am thirsty. And that jar of vinegar that was there. And sure, Jesus is experiencing real physical thirst here, but there is something deeper going on in this moment. See, Jesus is fulfilling scripture here. In Psalm 69, it says, They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. So what is John doing as he writes this account? He's inviting us to gaze with him through the horror of Jesus' suffering and to see who really has the power in this moment. To see who's really in control. Now this isn't to minimise at all the reality of Jesus' suffering, but in a way that we can never really understand, Jesus, as fully God and fully human, is calling all the shots in this moment. Let's not miss this on Good Friday. Jesus is not the victim here. He is completely in control, even to the point, even to the point where he chooses the moment where he gives up his life, even to the point where he chooses the moment of his own death. See, it says he gives up his spirit. He gives up his spirit. 
Jesus said before to his followers in John 10, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Jesus has all authority. Jesus is in control. The one who appears utterly powerless here is completely powerful. The one who looks like a victim is totally in control. And you know, if he's in control in this moment, it makes it all the more outrageous what Jesus allowed to happen to him on that cross. What shocking restraint Jesus showed on that cross. You know, one word from Jesus and the whole ordeal would have been over. Legions of angels awaited his command. One word from him, and yet, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Why? Why did he do it? Why did he allow all this to happen? Because this is what he came for. See, this isn't some unfortunate sequence of events. This isn't a tragic disaster that somehow God was able to turn and use for good. This was the mission. This was the whole reason he came. For Jesus' whole life was a journey to the cross. A journey that started way, way back in the depths of eternity when Father, Son and Spirit planned this great mission to come and rescue humanity. Could Jesus have stepped down from the cross in that moment? I completely had the power to do it, but if he'd saved himself, he couldn't have saved you and me. See, the only way that you and I could be forgiven for the things that we've done and said and thought that are wrong and that are a great affront against a holy God was for that holy, wonderful God to come and pay the debt himself. That's why he came. See, Jesus knew that this is what it would take for him to win us back to him. John Carson, the Bible scholar, writes this. It was not nails that held Jesus to that wretched cross. It was his unqualified resolution out of his love for his father to do his father's will. And within that framework, it was his love for sinners like me. Sinners like me. Sinners like you. And so on the cross, Jesus made himself nothing. Just as he had done his whole life. See, this is the way of Jesus. If he'd stepped down from the cross, he wouldn't have saved you and me. And if he'd stepped down from that cross, death and darkness would not have been defeated. See, Golgotha was not just an execution ground. It was a battlefield. The Roman soldiers weren't the real enemies here. This was a battle between Jesus and Satan and the powers of darkness against death itself. And there was only ever going to be one winner. See, Paul writes in his letter to the Colossians, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You know, this cross that to all people watching was this public spectacle In this moment, in making himself powerless, Jesus made a public spectacle of the powers of darkness. And the powers of darkness were shown to be nothing against the might of our wonderful God. See, at the cross, Jesus obliterated the power of sin and death. And this is what he came to do. He came to destroy sin and death and to save you and me. And you know, our world doesn't necessarily always look as though darkness has been defeated. Sin continues. Sickness exists. There's suffering everywhere. Maybe there are things in your life right now that don't feel like victory. But the cross promises us that death and darkness will not have the final word. See, if Jesus was in control, even in his death, then there's hope in all things. Hope that one day all things will be brought under the feet of Jesus. And that every knee will bow. And that every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so on the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished. And we say, what Jesus? What is finished? Everything that God came to accomplish through Jesus is finished. He has demonstrated his love for us in a way that needs nothing at all added to it. At the cross, he brought to completion everything that he came to do. That's why, that's why this is Good Friday. 
That's why we don't need to mourn on this day, but we can celebrate the victory of Jesus. So what do we do with that this morning? Well, I want to ask you one question here. I want to give us space to reflect on this one question. See, if Jesus is not a tragic victim in this scene, but the one holding all power and authority, then it brings challenge to us now. And so the question I want to ask you is this. Is Jesus in charge of your life? Is Jesus in charge of your life? Why don't you just take a moment just to close your eyes and reflect on that question. Is Jesus in charge of your life? Have you seen and acknowledged who he is? As you see this account that John's written of his death, do you see the power and the authority that he has? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Are you allowing him to take charge of your whole life? Are there any areas where you know you need to say, Jesus, take charge of this too? Take charge of my family. Take charge of this relationship. Take charge of these decisions and this situation. Take charge of my future. Is Jesus in charge of your life? Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for the authority and the power and the glory that is yours, Jesus. I thank you that you're Lord. I thank you that you reign. I thank you that you're in charge then. I thank you that you are in charge today. I thank you that you'll forever be in charge, Jesus. I thank you that you're Lord, that you're King. Jesus, would you come and be King over all of our lives, every circumstance, every situation, over what we believe about ourselves, Jesus, come and be King. Over our futures, Jesus, come and be King. Over the situations, Jesus, that feel like darkness has the upper hand, Jesus, come and be King. We want to give you everything this morning, Jesus. You're so worthy. And so we submit. And Lord, where we want to struggle against you, help us to submit to you, to your glory and your authority. We ask that, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Ron. So Ron's going to lead us into breaking bread. As we do this, let's take this as a a victory meal. Jesus is in control. He's in control.